Hey everyone, this is Mason. Just a quick shout out and a huge thank you to all of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. Your support is so appreciated and it helps us keep the lights on, as they say, here at both Herb Rally and the podcast. If you'd like to support our podcast by becoming a member of the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, you can do so for only $10 per month. You can try your first 30 days for free with coupon code podcast at checkout. And you can learn more and register at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And in addition, members get access to exclusive videos, classes, audio and monographs, a private Facebook group, discounts to herbal companies, and more. So one more time, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And don't forget to use the coupon code podcast at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. One more time, a huge thanks to all of our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. Now on to the show. Enjoy. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. The content in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. This information has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. We are not doctors, nor do we play one on the internet. Please seek advice from a qualified healthcare professional. Okay, MC Calico, take it away. Yeah. Smoky herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson. Yeah. Hey everyone, this is Mason with uh, Herb Rally. We're here for another episode of the Herbalist Hour, and today I'm joined by Jared Tarr, and he is the uh, intern and volunteer coordinator for an awesome uh, local Eugene nonprofit called Friends of Buford Buford Park. Uh, So welcome, Jared. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's great to be here. Great to be talking to all of you. Uh, Before the show, we were just going all all over all of our different talking points, and every single one, I'm like, oh my gosh, the herbal community is going to love this. Uh, So... uh, strap in and uh yeah it's gonna be a great episode (laughs) um uh but i would like to know a little bit more about your background how did you get into this work uh how how did you uh end up working at friends of beaufort park and and, uh, yeah just kind of take us along along that journey sure yeah um so i grew up on the southern oregon coast um grew up kind of in a conservation family so started paying attention to nature at a really young age um and uh, that eventually led me to Olympia, Washington, where I went to the Evergreen State College. Um, and I was positive that I wanted to be a research ecologist. Um, I had learned pretty quickly that that's really lonely work. And I like working with people. So, uh, so over time, you know, through a lot of relationships with other nonprofits, I worked with the Nature Conservancy, People for Puget Sound, a handful of other folks. Um, I yeah ended up moving to Eugene, uh, and uh, I had been working in the kind of prairies and oak savanna ecosystems mm. that we have here in Buford Park. Uh, and when I saw this position open up, it, it was kind of perfect. Uh, so yeah, I get to work with wonderful community of uh, volunteers and guest land stewards here, um, who you know, really have the, the uh, health and vibrancy of these ecosystems at the core of, of what they do. Um, and that, that's hugely rewarding. Yeah, I, I consider Olympia as like one of the herbal meccas. I like Eugene, <laughs> Asheville, North Carolina, <laughs> Olympia mm-hmm. for sure. So yeah, lots of herbalism going on over there. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us more about your program that you took at Evergreen? Is it my <laughs> understanding um, that you get to kind of choose your major at Evergreen or kind of create your own adventure type of thing? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, and, you know, I I, uh, I think Evergreen has changed a lot since I was there, mm-hmm. so I won't try to speak too authoritatively. Sure. Um, but, you know, it's a liberal arts school and uh, one in which you don't really have a major. You have areas of focus um, and... Uh, you don't really have grades, you have qualitative evaluations. So instead of a letter, you get a paragraph. Um, And that was really attractive to me because quantifying everything that we do in life, I think is pretty soul sucking. Um, So yeah, I ended up taking courses in microbial ecology and learning about mycology work um, and like industrial composting. taking botany courses and field ecology courses, courses in forestry, um, and then a lot of environmental education. Uh, and uh, you know, I don't think any evergreen education would be complete without some uh, like 
political economy and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, got, took a great class. I was just looking at sci-fi uh, authors <laughs> and writing and looking at it through like a uh, radical political lens. And, That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you were saying pre-show that you were roommates with Peter McCoy, right? It's so you true. almost got yeah. mycological education on the side too. That's <laughs> yeah. pretty rad. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there were times where, you know, there were, uh, like miniature greenhouses full of, uh, you know, blocks of mycorrhizae, <laughs> um, all sorts of like experiments happening in the kitchen. Um, it was, it was definitely a, a cool time to be in that, in that community. And just for your reference, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, he wrote a book called uh, Radical Mycology. So we'll leave a link to that in the show notes. Um, so uh, actually, you first reached out to me, I want to say almost a year ago, uh, and you were, uh, you were asking me about uh, the invasive uh, teasel out here, right? And mm -hmm. how maybe we could link the herbal community uh, to your teasel project. We'll get into more of that later. But uh, um, it's, I'm glad that we've, we're finally able to make this happen. Yeah. Um, but why don't we go over some of these talking points and get into the juicy stuff? Sure. Yeah. I'm not texting right now. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's let's talk about the theme of uh, working in the Upper Willamette Valley and context of nonprofits and land stewardship. Yeah. Great. So um, Friends of Buford Park in Mount Pisgah is one of a host of conservation nonprofits that are. Um, in themselves part of a uh, kind of a quilt of organizations, both public and nonprofit, who are responsible for stewarding huge swaths of land. Um, and, you know, this is land that is being managed for different purposes here in Howard Buford Recreation Area, which is where a lot of our work is centered. Um, we are really focused on uh, enhancing and stewarding the native habitats and ecosystems that exist here and balancing that with uh, compatible recreation. And so this park receives over 500,000 visits a year. Wow. Uh, and so the, the reason for that is because it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that as humans, we really know when we're looking at and existing in a habitat and an ecosystem that is healthy mm -hmm. um, and that has that kind of vibrancy that you really can only have when you are managing for the native species mm -hmm. that have been evolving here for millions of years. Yeah. Um, and this is one of those places. So, you know, we have big swaths of oak savanna and upper Willamette Prairie habitat here. Um, and those are some of the most endangered ecosystems that are west of the Mississippi River. Um, there's between 2 and 10% of their original range remaining. Mm. And some of the largest contigu contiguous chunks of those are here in the park. Okay. Um, and so we work with the public pretty extensively um, and really try to bring folks along in the understanding that... Um, conserving these places is part and parcel to them being enjoyable for recreation and, and visiting. Um, yeah. yeah, so we're actually staying just down the road at one of the <laughs> RV parks and uh, I always think, oh, I'm gonna go to Mount Pisgah. I need to start thinking about coming to Buford Park more <laughs> and just walking <laughs> yeah, around because sure. it is beautiful out here. So if right. I were to kind of Walk around. What do people usually do when they come here? Are they bringing their dogs and just kind of walking around? Or yeah, the trails? So this part of the park, we're in the north end of the of HBRA um, right now, and this is like one of the hot spots for dog walking. <laughs> okay. um, which you know that's um, a really good case study for us yeah. in in thinking about compatible recreation with native wildlife um, and and ecosystems. So folks love to walk their dogs. I have a dog, I love to walk her too. It's really nice when I can take her somewhere beautiful and have her off leash where she can just exist. Mm. Um, but also in this part of the park, we have denning coyotes. And denning coyotes do not get along very well with off leash dogs. And so that's just one of those <clears throat> kind of rich examples of how um, bringing folks along in education of what uh, a habitat or an ecosystem requires to be happy and healthy mm -hmm. um, is sometimes limiting on our activity in those places. Um, but it's, it's really for the benefit of such a larger system. 
um, than just where you go to walk your dog. Um, but folks come here to ride horses. They come here to hike. Um, it's one of the main hiking destinations in kind of the Eugene Springfield metro area. So. You also have that uh, native plant nursery over there, which, which you have a lot of volunteers and as well as U of O students over there working as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so Friends works in kind of three primary program areas. Um, we do trails maintenance, and so we, we maintain around 27 miles of trail here in the park. Um, and then we do habitat restoration, which is a lot of what uh, we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also maintain a native plant nursery. So in that nursery, we grow uh, around 130 different native species. Um, and those are grown out primarily for restoration purposes. So um, we grow out some plants to be outplanted, um, trees, shrubs, herbaceous species, um, and then really the, the primary focus of the plant materials program is production of seed. Okay. Um, and so we, we grow plants out through their whole season mm -hmm. um, from, you know, sprouting, flowering, fruiting, um, those seeds maturing, harvest those plant materials, and then go through a pretty intensive process at times of cleaning the seed out of the chaff. Um, and then once we have that seed, we're able to utilize that in restoration projects. Um, when we have a prescribed fire out here, which is one of our preferred methods mm. for, uh, for stewardship and particularly you know, invasive species management, um, we're able to broadcast native seeds um, and in that way really enhance the, the composition of, of native species that are in those, those uh, landscapes. When was your last burn? We were able to burn a unit over on the east side of the park, which is um, adjacent to Pleasant Hill, which is a really small mm. rural community. That's one of the beautiful things about this park. We really bridge, we bridge one of the largest metro areas in Oregon yeah. with small rural communities. Mm. So it's a place where those communities really come together. Um, so on the east side, we burned a unit called Meadow, Meadow Lark East. Um, it's a, uh, has chunks of wet prairie in it. Mm -hmm. And wet prairie is, is a subtype of these kind of open grassy ecosystems. And there's actually a species called Bradshaw's Lomatium. It's in the carrot family um, that uh, it was just recently federally delisted, mm. um, but is still a state endangered species. And so um, we were able to burn in that area. We burn in a way that is seasonally informed, so we're not having negative impacts on those native species. Mm. Um, and it was, it was an awesome burn to be a part of because it really burned in this kind of mosaic pattern. So there are areas that were totally mm. untouched, areas that burned more intensively, and then areas where the fire just kind of moved quickly over mm. the surface. Um, and that kind of disturbance is really critical for uh, a lot of these habitats where you know, human uh, roles in the ecology of the place have been uh, a part of them for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I think that that is, it's a lot of native wisdom yeah. that as Euro-Americans on this landscape, we've ignored for yeah. hundreds of years. Um, and I feel like there's a way that the conservation community is just starting to get up to speed with where uh, native folks were in, 1859, um, yeah. as far as understanding how, how uh, those stewardship practices are really beneficial for humans and other creatures on the landscape. It's so good to hear that it's becoming back in fashion to do these controlled burns. And I, you haven't mentioned the, uh, the Oregon oak or the Oregon white oak yet. And I'm just curious, um, I w it was my understanding that we did controlled burns to help uh, the Oregon white oak, but you're, it mm -hmm. sounds like you're doing it almost for lots of different plant species as well, is that true? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the, yeah, the plant species that grow in these oak savannas, mm -hmm. um, they've all adapted to fire in mm -hmm. one way or another. Uh, fireweed? And so, um, fire, fireweed <laughs> for one, yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a reason it's named that, it, it <laughs> loves fire. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of other species that really love fire. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, oak is, is one that's interesting because a fire can absolutely kill an oak, mm. um, particularly when there hasn't been fire around that oak mm. for a long time. 
And so it's the, it's the return interval for these fires that is really crucial to them acting in a, in a healthy way on the landscape. Um, you know, fires have their own behavior, they have their own weather. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you really like push away that part of the ecology of the place for a long time, it comes back in ways that um, are really challenging to work with. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, and you know we, we see that in in our woodland areas and our forests where we're we have annual catastrophic wildfire yeah. here, um, and those are in places where if we had more regular fire return intervals, if we were working with fire um, as a tool and as as really uh, an ally on the landscape. Um, we'd be in a much better place. Hey everyone, it's Mason. Just a quick interruption from the show to let you know about our 13 herbal freebies. If you go to herbrally.com on the navigation bar at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says freebies. Just click there and you'll sign up for our email newsletter. And in exchange, we're offering 13 herbal freebies. That's eBooks, webinars, videos, downloadable audio, and discounts to cool herbal companies. So if you'd like to check out these freebies as well as sign up for our email newsletter, we update you about uh, current events, new monographs, new videos, etc. Just go to herbrally.com and click on the button at the top of the page that simply says freebies. Okay, that's it for me. Now back to the show. Do you think, say, in 10 years, as we learn more and do this more, our, our Northwest forests and the California forests might uh, be more healthier? Do you, do you see this on the horizon? Certainly. I mean, it's, yeah. it's been, you know, I think that prescribed fire in the U.S., it's been a, like, long, hard road yeah. um, to get to where we are now. Hmm. Um, and it's definitely being accepted as a, a more viable management strategy and tool. Um, we are really hoping that, uh, we'll, we're planning that this year will be the year of good fire mm. here in, uh, HBRA. Mm. Um, and so we have a number of different burns planned. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's on the minds of every conservation organization we work with. Very cool. Um, and there are really dedicated individuals, um, and, uh, communities who are, uh, really trying to do the education that's necessary to help under people understand what healthy fire looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, and then really work with the agencies that have a lot of say as far as what can happen to encourage them to accept fire as a management tool. That's really fascinating. I don't know we're going to talk about fire, but that's, uh, <laughs> it's good to hear that there's a, uh, there's hope. Yeah. So that brings us to, let's, uh, let's chat a little bit about cultivating healthy landscape scale relationships. Uh, and touching on non-native, non-native and native species, and defining invasive. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think that. Um, I mean, going back to um, thinking about how many folks are on this landscape at any time, uh, I think that one of the big pieces of work that we have that's you know it's soft work. It's not mm. going out in the field and pulling weeds yeah. <laughs> um, or uh, or maintaining a trail. Yeah. It is working with the, the community of folks who visit this place and helping them understand what, um, what being in healthy and right relationship to these landscapes looks like. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think that that's something that a lot of folks are thinking about culturally, mm -hmm. um, being in right relationship with one another, um, being in right relationship with communities we're not a part of. Um, and you know, the plants and animals that live in these natural areas is that's another community that yeah. we need to consider in the same light uh and so you know we do a lot of outreach we are a grassroots organization and so we involve our volunteers at every level of our organization all the way from like making decisions about how we maintain trails and what we do on trails mm -hmm. to what strategies we use for you know, encouraging the uh, native species that live here and managing the species that might be pushing them out of those spaces. Um, and so that's like, that's a big cultural project mm -hmm. that we're engaged in. Um, and yeah, I think it's worth noting too that humans have been a part of the ecology of the ecosystems that we have been indigenous to 
for as long as we've existed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so othering humans from the landscapes that we're existing in is, um, you know, that disconnection, I think, gives a lot of folks a f license to be less caring and less mm. responsible. That makes sense. On those landscapes. Yeah. I like the term othering. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just whatever isn't you. Yeah. You know? Um, and it's easy to do that with things that don't have eyes. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful about the herbalism community mm -hmm. is that the relationship with plants is is such a, uh, a keystone of the work. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, I can speak for a lot of the folks in the conservation world where that that's the same for us, yeah. you know. Um, I have deep personal relationships with Danthonia californica <laughs> that like grows on the coast where I grew up and it grows in Olympia, Washington mm -hmm. where I learned so much and it grows here in the valley. It's just a plant that's existed everywhere that's been important to me. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, recognizing the role that we have in opening folks' eyes and awareness up to what that plant is yeah. in the first place. That's one of those first steps. Um, and so a lot of that too is thinking about, you know, what is a native plant? What is a non-native plant? Um, what does invasive mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what are, and, and we are working with another term which is encroaching. Mm. And so, <clears throat> you know, native plants, are those plants that have been evolving mm -hmm. on these landscapes for millions of years. Mm -hmm. um, they've been co-evolving. They have relationships with one another. They have relationships with the indigenous people who uh, have been here for time immemorial. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those relationships have been disturbed in big ways by Euro-American colonization mm -hmm and the plants that have come with mm -hmm. that, uh, that institution. And so, um, you know, non-native species represent all of, all of that import that has happened. Um, but often, you know, I think that the idea of non-native is just one and the same with invasive. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's a lot more depth there that is important to consider. So, you know, invasive species are ones that I really think of as not being in right relationship with their neighbors, mm -hmm. right? Um, <clears throat> it's a behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and these species, they're not choosing to uh, be malevolent. <laughs> you know, they, they, they don't have a sense of morality. Um, they are just living their best lives. Yeah in the place that they've been plopped. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, when we start to work with plants like blackberries, like Scott's broom, um, mm. like teasel, um, mm -hmm. we, it, it, it's, it's another um, relationship. And so thinking about, okay, how can we encourage this plant to behave in ways that make space for all of the native species who were here before it mm -hmm. um, and make space for this habitat and ecosystem being vibrant and functioning well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, it's not about eradication. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really about stewarding those plants' existence on the landscape that we're never going to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. You know, restoration is not about returning to some mythical pre-state because um, yeah. that's not possible, right? Time happens <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and we are where we are. That's a sticker, um, time happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think it's really a matter of recognizing the role that we as humans yeah. and particularly I think we as Euro-American settlers have in um, stewarding the relationships with the plants that we decided had a role here yeah. to play um, or accidentally brought here. But far more of the plants that we see and we have to work with in these ways are ones that were brought here intentionally. Um, you know, Scott's broom. Or unintentionally. Or, or yeah, yeah, sure. But, but, but I think that that intentional piece yeah. is really important mm -hmm. to recognize because it 
captures the role that these plants have um, and the role that they were intended to have mm -hmm. by someone at some point. So like Scott's broom was brought to Oregon <laughs> to beautify and uh, stabilize soils on the sides of our, our on our roadsides. Mm. Um, it did that job really well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Talk about a demonized plant too. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, when you think about the, the ecology and the natural history of that plant, yeah. it's, it loves disturbance. Mm -hmm. Humans create a lot of disturbance. Um, it fixes nitrogen in those soils, uh, which is beneficial to all sorts of plants, native and non-native. Um, and yeah, those yellow flowers They're are really pretty, pretty <laughs> if you don't necessarily have all of the other context for what that plant is doing on the <laughs> landscape, right? Um, and so recognizing that, yeah, that plant had a role to mm -hmm. play yeah. and we brought it here. <laughs> it played that role for us really well. And now it's, it, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's doing what it, needs and wants to do and what it has evolved to do yeah. where it came from for millions of years. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that just all, all feeds into this like landscape scale mm -hmm. idea of, of relationships and um, yeah, and just acting in healthy ways where we live um, and on the, on, in the places that we enjoy. I think that was so beautifully put. Um, I think you should honestly consider teaching at an herb conference. I think a lot of people would really dig it. Um, it was very beautifully put. You're not demonizing the plants. Uh, you're, you're talking about stewardship versus eradication. Um, yeah, just a, a really cool way to look at it. There's a book I want to say it's called like evil plants. I don't know. Have you heard of this? Like, I haven't. I think it's basically about different plants throughout history who've been used like say to poison people or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really digging like, you know, putting those types of labels on plants. Cause yeah, they, they, uh, they're, they're thriving and they, I guess, serve a function and, and all that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you, you put that really beautifully. <laughs> Keep rambling. <laughs> Great. Will do. Native, non-native is very divisive. I like how you did weed in quotations too. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's the quote? Um, a weed is a plant whose virtues are unknown. Yeah. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I love that quote. And it's like the herbal community, I mean, my spirit plant's dandelion, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which is like the, the weed. Are you getting all this? I am. Okay. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> so Jared, how does scale affect wild crafting from a restoration perspective? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think scale when we're thinking in business terms, mm -hmm. right, affects everything. Yeah. Um, and so one of the challenges that um, land stewards, and I'm using that term really broadly, so that encompasses everybody from like the Forest Service and the BLM to small nonprofits like ourselves, um, is recognizing that uh, native plants and plants period have economic value. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I have to imagine that is an evolution that you've seen in the herbal world. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> you know, there are more like squares and normies talking about <laughs> using herbal remedies yeah. than I ever knew of yeah. as a like kid raised by hippies. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, I think that when we introduce those economic factors into those relationships with plants, um, we have to be really careful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that there's, um, there are ways to have wild crafting and harvest of native plants and in these habitats that are sensitive and that have all sorts of other pressures mm -hmm. that are affecting them. Um, that is responsible and, um, but it requires cultivating that relationship in a way that isn't like a couple years of book learning about those plants. It's, um, it's years of watching that plant and harvesting just what you need from that plant and seeing how it responds. Um, you know, there are instances where, yeah, you could take a, an entire individual from a patch of 200 inter individuals mm -hmm. um, 
and more than likely that's not going to have a lasting deleterious effect on that community. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that when we're thinking about <clears throat> harvesting plant materials to be used for products that are going to then be used by a lot of people who don't necessarily have those relationships with those plants, that the amount of care that we put into that first step mm -hmm. of the process, which is, you know, knowing the landscapes that we're on, finding that plant and taking that material from that plant, um, the more care that is put into that process, the, the, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's, there are ways that um, those of us in the conservation community who, you know, might overlap into the herbal community, but, but where this land stewardship work is really our home, um, we have a lot of knowledge and expertise that we, we would love to share <laughs> with folks <laughs> who you. want to be active in these landscapes. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I think that we have dealt with locally, um, observing instances where folks have come through in public lands, the commons, places that are supposed to be for all of us, and taken every single Oregon grape branch that they can find. Right. Um, or even just like removed far greater than half of the aerial parts of an entire patch. Um, and that's really disturbing for us, I think, in the conservation community. In part because we don't have yet relationships with those folks. Mm -hmm. If we knew who th those folks were and we were in um, collaboration with them around their interest in the landscape and, and what's important to them in that landscape, I think that would look a lot different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there are these systems of like permits and, um, <clears throat> and licenses for harvest. And while the process for getting those can be bureaucratic and challenging and boring, um, it's really an opportunity for collaboration between conservation organizations and folks who have a lot of expertise in, in what these plants can be used for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a way that we can open up the conversation for sharing expertise across those two communities. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of work and growth that needs to happen in that. Um, and, you know, I think too, in the work that we do in managing invasive species on the landscape, that there are a lot of opportunities to say, hey, do you have interest in this species? Because mm -hmm. right. <laughs> this species is one that we have interest in managing in different ways. Are you talking about like similar <laughs> medicinal uses uh, for a more weedy species? Uh, in the herbal world, we call those herbal analogs. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Plant analogs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I don't have enough herbalism knowledge sure. <laughs> to speak to a lot, but yeah. I know that um, teasel, for one, mm. has medicinal properties. Yeah. Um, and uh, teasel also, for us, you know, when we think about the amount of land that we have to do our work on. So, for instance, we, we are an organization of eight people. Mm -hmm. That's administrative staff and folks who are on the ground. Um, we steward uh, well, well over, well, we, we steward 2,200 acres just here in the park. Wow. So do the math. Yeah. It's <laughs> a lot of acres per person. Yeah. <clears throat> and there are only so many hours in the day and so many days in the year. Right. And so in order to care for these landscapes with the resources that we have available to us, um, we have to consider means of doing so that, um, that have been them, of themselves been demonized in a lot of ways. So we use herbicide. Mm. Um, and if you look at a patch of blackberry and Scott's broom that is covering eight acres of land, 
Um, I would invite, invite anyone <laughs> to think of another solution that can, um, in a timely way, create the space for other species to exist there. Just a quick break from the show to let you know about the Herb Rally events page. Did you know that we add new herbalism events from all over the United States and the world for that matter on an almost daily basis? You can peruse herbalism events at herbrally.com slash events and hopefully find something in your neck of the woods. You can also search by state to make it even easier to find a plant walk, conference, or class near you. And we also list virtual herbalism events as well. Check those out at herbrally.com slash virtual. And again, for the in-person events, go to herbrally.com slash events. All right, back to the show. Um, and that is, you know, the caveat on that, of course, is that <clears throat> if everybody did, you know, management activities on 10 invasive species a day, yeah. we'd, we'd have it solved. Right, right. <laughs> it would be fine. Yeah. Um, but that's just not the case, and that's not the culture we're currently yeah. living in. And so, um, so, you know, there are species like teasel where herbicide is not the solution. It doesn't yeah. work all that well. Teasel also has uh, leaves that create water cups. It's actually yeah. a, a semi-carnivorous plant. Did not know that. So, wow. um, so insects fall into that water, and then that water helps to increase the nutrients in the soil that teasel lives in. Are you saying the water, the, the, the bugs get trapped in, have some sort of solution that help digest the bug into the plant? To My get understanding the is that there are some digestive enzymes. Wow, that I did not know that. exist in that water. Wow. Um, and, uh, and, you know, regardless, yeah. that, that just that structure mm -hmm. creates an environment in which nutrients from new places can get into the soil that's mm. there. And teasel being a biennial plant, too, means that anything that's trapped there is going to fall down in the next year two years um, and go to fertilize the new seedlings that might be there um, but you know our method for working on teasel management is clipping the seed cones mm -hmm. really trying to sequester those seeds and reduce the seed bank that exists there um, and then also digging the roots um, digging out plants, mm -hmm. mechanical removal, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to uh, keep those plants from going to seed mm -hmm. in the following year. And it was great news to us when we learned that the roots are actually what is valuable mm -hmm. for, for folks. And so you know, I think that while we look at and work with the challenges of native plants having value economic, cultural, um, personal value, um, that we can really invite in recognizing the values that these invasive species have as well. Um, and you know, we live in capitalism and where there's a market, there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know, creating a market for more of these invasive species plant materials is a huge opportunity. And it's a, an opportunity to, to benefit the, the commons and these beautiful places that people enjoy so much. And it's an opportunity to benefit folks who want to make their livelihoods in ways that are centered around relationship with plants. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would love to see more of that happening. And I know organizations like ours and many others would invite those relationships. Is this a good point to talk about uh, the Teasel program or how you want to kind of reach out to the herbal community and how they can participate or? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we have, as one of our many, many projects, um, uh, one that we just refer to as our Invasive Species Utilization Project. So we have a relationship with Wildcraft Cider Works. Um, where uh, there are a number of heirloom apple trees that are here, in, particularly in this area of the park, um, and heirloom walnut trees. We also have English hawthorn. Mm -hmm. um, all of those plants have uh, plant materials that are useful in cider making. So uh, there's a liqueur that's made from the walnuts. Um, uh, there's a 
Pisgah heirloom cider that is made from apples from the site. Have that. I've um, had that before. Yeah. yeah. It's it's great. Um, <laughs> and then and then uh, the hawthorn palms, the, the berries that come off of hawthorn trees are used in other ciders of theirs. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's just amazing to yeah. get to see those species, which, you know, birds love all those things. Mm. Um, the cows that used to roam all over this landscape when this was... The wild cows. Um, pretty wild. Um, when, when this was a, a homestead and dairy farm, okay. um, they spread those seeds far and wide, um, along with like sweet cherry that has started to grow wild because of that distribution. Um, it's great to be able to sequester those seeds, mm -hmm. make delicious cider out of them, and then keep them from propagating on the landscape. Yeah. Um, and then for teasel, really that's been, it's been an experimental process. Yeah. You know, again, because we as a conservation organization don't have the expertise in herbal plant materials. Yeah. So, um, you know, we started to establish relationships with like wild crafting wholesalers mm -hmm. um, and really like feeling out those relationships for how um, ethical they were necessarily yeah. because recognizing that there is harvest of native plant materials that in our eyes as a conservation organization just isn't happening in ethical ways. Um, we didn't necessarily want to work with folks who were inviting that activity sure. and incentivizing it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so that's, that's been a hurdle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then also um, really trying to, like we do in all of our programs, expand the community that we're engaging mm -hmm. for that activity. And so um, last year we had a, a pretty successful experience in working with Looking Glass School, which is Very cool. um, it's an alternative school here in Eugene. A lot of the kids who are engaged there are, um, classrooms are challenging. Mm -hmm. And when you can invite them into a classroom that looks like this, <laughs> um, things look a lot different. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and additionally, saying, hey, digging up these roots mm -hmm. is really beneficial for the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, making this classroom a happier, healthier place. And it's also a source of income. Yeah. Um, so that's been a partnership that we've developed and you know we're continuing to develop and work with um but there's there's a missing piece there mm -hmm. and i think that you know the uh those relationships that are just based in transactions <laughs> are ones that don't have depth and they don't have um they, they aren't informed really by the the uh, work that we do here. Mm -hmm. And so our hope, and I would love if this is a catalyst for that, is to engage more individuals in the herbalism community to um, work with organizations like ours, mm -hmm. um, to harvest for themselves plant materials that um, are useful to them. And that's a process that you know, we can uh, facilitate through our conservation partners. Um, you know, this park is owned by Lane County mm. and we are guest stewards here. And um, there's another nonprofit that operates in the park. And so we, you know, we have to operate within a pretty complex web of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can faci facilitate those, those uh, relationships with herbalists to come out here. Um, be informed about the the priorities we have and the the work that we are doing after you know 32 years of stewarding these landscapes and the knowledge that we have um, gained from that really long-standing relationship with these plants and places um, and yeah just I, I mean, I, I want to have work parties of herbalists out here mm -hmm. where we're just going after a patch of teasel and being able to come back the next year and see that, yeah, there are fewer individuals yeah. and recognizing that that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
but then maybe the next year looking at like harvesting blackberry leaves yeah. or you know whatever might be of use and valuable and um and a way that we can integrate that work in a much broader community context um i think there's a lot of space for you know restorative uh certified herbal products mm -hmm. <laughs> um where there's uh you know, there's an understanding for consumers that those products came to them via a relationship with place and a process that is um, really beneficial for, for all of the organisms involved. Have you heard that there's medicinal value in the blackberry root? No. Yeah, so it's a okay. very uh, highly astringent. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's kind of known as like good for if you have like diarrhea. Um, sure. But you could put a sign at the end of the driveway that says you pick blackberry root. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's right? a Steven Yeager joke. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I love the idea of work parties and um, getting more herbalists involved. I know we still have a couple more points to go over. Yeah. So not to sound like I'm wrapping it up, but if people are interested and want to contact you, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, so um, our website is a great resource. It's bufordpark.org. Um, my direct email is <laughs> volunteer at bufordpark.org. Um, and, you know, I am kind of the one who's coordinating a lot of those efforts. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think that those would probably be the best, best two places. Very good. So you mentioned this term encroaching earlier, and I, I was fascinated by that. I'd never heard that before. So why don't you tell us more about encroaching, specifically maybe around the uh, Doug firs and the, uh, the Oregon white oak? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's a term to... Um, really distinguish the behaviors of non-native species um, versus native species in, and it can be in similar habitats. So um, in the oak savanna and prairie ecosystems that we work in primarily, uh, they have been dependent on disturbance, usually in the form of fire, for millennia. Mm -hmm. um, Doug fir really in um, geologic historical terms is a newcomer mm -hmm. to lowland areas. And so uh, that, and it, and it doesn't like fire. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, uh, so we actually have areas of oak savanna that have started to be encroached upon by Douglas fir because white people also haven't historically liked fire. Right. <laughs> um, and so uh, with that fire exclusion that has happened, those Douglas fir, their behavior doesn't leave space mm -hmm. for those other organisms. And so, um, you know, we, uh, it, and it's kind of amazing the way that that can be reflected in the shape of a tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you think about like the stereotypical profile of a oak tree. It has this like kind of beautiful mushroom shape to it, right? Yeah. The only way that it gets to that shape is because of having ample access to sunlight on all aspects, sure. right? Yeah. Um, when Douglas fir starts to encroach and Again, Douglas fir is just living its best life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it it's wants not evil. That, yeah, it yeah. wants that sun too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when it starts to really encroach in an area, those oak trees, their shape changes. Mm. So they become these like skinny, vase-like. Wow, I'm trees. gonna have to pay attention to that. I've never noticed that or thought about it. Yeah, and yeah. so so over the you know past couple of decades, more than, more than that, I'm sure, yeah. there have been a lot of projects called Oak Release. Yeah. We're really trying to release oaks from, from the binds of the coniferous species, you know, cedars, um, firs, um, that, that are really hemming them in. And so you can look at patches of oaks and you can tell, did you grow up with all the light you needed mm. or did you grow up really searching for that light sure. the whole time. Um, Douglas fir also grows a lot faster than oaks do. And so it has that competitive edge. 
and it's really only through the relationship with um, humans uh, and lightning, right, right. <laughs> um, a major source of you know ignition for wildfire, um, that uh, that those oaks are able to live their best lives, mm -hmm. and Douglas fir is encouraged into being in better relationship with all of those other species. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe this is the capitalist coming out, but I'm curious, uh, is there a difference between say cutting down a dug fir and using it for its timber as opposed to doing like a controlled burn? Uh, sure. I suppose the fire, again, going back to our earlier part of the conversation is beneficial to a lot of other species. Uh, right. So there's the advantage <clears throat> there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this ties into, you know, a lot of our, our um, messaging and intent around talking to the herbalist community yeah. about invasive species um, is that, that that economic piece mm -hmm. is really important. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when we think about doing those kinds of conifer management activities, um, if revenue can come from that, if there is some economic benefit that can be reaped, yeah. um, then that means that we have more resources to do more work across more area. Sure. Um, and do our work in better ways, yeah. both for ourselves as the folks, you know, where our livelihoods are based on the health of these ecosystems and our ability to do the stewardship work. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're able to really spread those resources in different ways. Yeah. So the kinds of fires that we look to have on the landscape here are low intensity and low severity. Mm -hmm. And so that intensity piece refers to during a fire, how much heat is produced, how tall those flames are, mm -hmm. um, how fast the fire moves across the landscape. And those all have effects on the in severity. And the severity refers to what the impacts of those fire, that fire or those fires, mm -hmm. as they're fires more often, what those long-term impacts are. Okay. And so um, the kinds of fires that kill conifers and the kinds of fires that kill oaks, for that matter, are ones that are of higher severity. Mm -hmm. And that's usually because of a lot of fuel loading, right? Where you have a lot of woody material, a lot of um, you know, thatch from grasses. Mm -hmm. Blackberry is a wonderful example mm -hmm. because blackberry burns like heck. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, blackberry produces a lot of material yeah. as it grows. And so we have to be really careful when we are planning prescribed burns because an ecological burning in general, one, because those are the requirements that we're under. The, the restrictions around how you can implement prescribed fire are strict and uh, extensive. Okay. Um, they're really you know, comprehensive of all of the potential risk involved. Um, and we have to look at it also from that ecological lens of how do we protect the oaks where we're burning mm -hmm. and how do we, um, you know, control that fire in ways that are um, contributing to our objectives there. Okay. So removing thatch, pushing back Douglas fir trees. Um, so we, we don't ever want a situation or at least in very specific situations, we, we would be open to like a Douglas fir tree torching, yeah. um, but generally not yeah. because that's not the kind of fire that really is beneficial for the, the habitats that we work in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a Douglas fir tree torching and then falling down or, or whatever, like that's a huge amount of heat. It's a, it's the, the impacts from that um, are gonna be ones that really take a much longer time to recover from for native species and, and uh, other parts of the ecology that we wanna encourage there. So typically on the show, we ask, you know, what's your favorite part about being an herbalist? Uh, but you don't identify as an herbalist. So we're going to say, Jared, what's your favorite part about the work that you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think that at least 
uh, at least this week. Yeah. Um, my favorite part about the work that I do is uh, all of the relationships that I get to cultivate. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to cultivate relationships with um, the my coworkers, folks who are, you know, equally passionate and dedicated to um, serving the all of the organisms that live on this landscape in the best way possible. Uh, I get to cultivate relationships with volunteers who um, are really pushing aside a lot of the structures of capitalism and mm -hmm. profit. Um, they're coming out here and giving their time in uh, for that same mission. And then cultivating deeper relationships with the land and with the plants and with the animals that all depend on this place that I get to spend my time caring for. I love that. And um, besides herbal medicine, if you want other types of medicine for your like mental and spiritual health, volunteering is honestly one of the best things you could do. <laughs> uh, when I was a kid, I, I would volunteer at the library. I love volunteering mm -hmm. there. Um, the soup kitchen at Food for Lane County was another good one. Mm -hmm. But if you're in the Eugene area, definitely consider volunteering at uh, Friends of Buford Park. They're doing awesome work. Um, just want to say thanks for taking the time, Jared. That was yeah. super informative, and I love hearing a perspective from a you know non-herbalist. But you really know your stuff, so <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for the opportunity, really, to talk to folks. You know, yeah. I think that finding the the connectors for these communities can be really challenging yeah. sometimes. Um, so this is just a wonderful opportunity for that. And uh, yeah, just great talking to you. Likewise, so uh, Buford, uh, bufordpark.org yep. and volunteer at bufordpark.org. So, yeah. all right, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. And that's gonna do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's join to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.